Hi everyone, my name is Cassandra Gluck and for my seminar presentation assignment for protein metabolism, I will be discussing the paper called Leucine Stimulates Protein Synthesis in Skeletal Muscles of Neonatal Pigs by Enhancing mTOR C1 Activation. This paper and study was done at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and the authors are Sarah Wan et al. So let's go ahead and get started on learning more about what this paper and study did. So with the lecture outline um, for today's seminar presentation, I'll first discuss the research background that's pertinent to understand what is going on in the study. Then we'll discuss the hypothesis of the study. Finally, we'll go into the details on the research procedure, so the materials and methods. Then I will discuss the key results. And finally, I will discuss um, you know, the discussion, implications, and overall conclusion of the study. So a little refresher from exam two. Um, so this paper focuses specifically on leucine. And as we know, leucine is a branch chain amino acid. It is also an essential amino acid, so it must be provided in the diet. And some further classifications of leucine are it's neutral, it's aliphatic, and it's hydrophobic. And here is the structure of leucine right here. All right, so this is a overview of leucine metabolism. So as we learned in class, leucine gets converted to the keto acid, keto isocaproate, then it goes to isovaleryl coa then to beta-methylcrotonyl-CoA, and then it can eventually become acetyl-CoA to be used for energy production. So that kind of is detailed right here, but again, we learned that in class and we had to know that for the second exam. But as you can see in the figure, leucine is also involved in mTOR, specifically mTOR C1. So I'll discuss that a little bit further in the next few slides as that's an important background to understand for this study specifically. So mTOR stands for mammalian target of rampamycin. So let's first discuss this. So mTOR is a serine threonine kinase that plays important roles within cellular physiology, such as transcription and protein synthesis. Um, mTOR C1, so there's two forms of mTOR. So there is mTOR C1, and that is rampamycin sensitive, and it consists of mTOR, raptor, and GBL, which stands for G protein beta subunit like protein. That's a big mouthful. Um, this form of mTOR's activity can be influenced by amino acids such as leucine, hormones such as insulin, nutrients, as well as other factors. So as we learned earlier in the semester before the first exam, mTOR C1 can increase protein synthesis in response to cellular conditions, which causes phosphorylated 4-EBP1 to be activated, which then causes the initiation factor EIF4E to disassociate, ultimately increasing the occurrence of protein synthesis. So mTOR C2 is the second form of mTOR, and this form is rampamycin insensitive. So it consists of mTOR, Richter, and GBL. And one factor of mTOR C2 that has been discovered recently, um, according to Sarbosov et al., is that it activates the growth factor, factor regulated protein kinase B, also known as PKB. So here is the figure showing um, the functions that mTOR C1 and mTOR C2 play within the body. So again, we can see that mTOR C1 with the mTOR, the raptor, while the mTOR C2 has the mTOR and Richter. So again, we can see that the mTOR C1 is rampamycin sensitive, as I said here. Um, but mTOR C2 is generally considered rampamycin insensitive. 
Um, but some chronic exposures from rampamycin could affect mTOR C2. So again, we can see that mTOR C1 has a number of different important functions like protein synthesis um, and same with mTOR C2. All right, so next I wanted to discuss rapamycin specifically. So it is actually an FDA approved drug. It was first discovered on the Easter Island in soil samples as an antifungal metabolite. So what it's known for, it has been found to be an inhibitor of mTOR in S6K1 activation, which is also a serine threonine kinase. So rapamycin has been used to treat a variety of issues like cancer, and it has been used as an immunosuppressant for organ transplant patients. It has perceived anti-aging effects from some studies done in mice, but there haven't been any human studies done using rapamycin yet. So again, you can see from this figure here, there's just a couple different um, functions that rapamycin can have an effect on. So you can see cancer, immune system, metabolic diseases. So now let's get into the research significance and the objectives of this specific study. So the overall significance of this lab's research or this particular study is that they are trying to identify mechanisms that regulate protein deposition to improve strategies for nutrition management of low birth weight infants by using neonatal pigs as a model. So again, since they're doing this study at the Baylor College of Medicine, the neonatal pig is a model for those neonate humans. So specifically based on the literature, molecular mechanisms which amino acids like leucine regulate mTOR C1 activation in vivo are still unknown. So this study is really trying to keep adding information in that specific area of research. So the research objective of this specific study was to determine the mechanism leucine utilizes to modulate mTOR C1 activation in vivo by using rapamycin. So specifically what these, uh, what the authors hypothesized was that the ability of rapamycin to disturb that raptor mTOR interaction is greater in the skeletal muscle of leucine infused pig, piglets compared to saline infused piglets. All right, so now let's get into the research procedure. So they had N equals 23 piglets and these piglets weighed about two kilograms in body weight, and they were from three different litters. So the actual study took place at seven days of age. However, three days before the experiment began, pigs were anesthetized, so the piglets were anesthetized, and then a catheter was inserted into the jugular vein and the carotid artery, which we've discussed you know, a few times in class, um, that they can do this to help measure digestibility and such. So once this procedure was done and the catheters were inserted, um, the pigs were allowed to return to their sow until the experiment actually took place. So, you know, on that seven days of age, the experiment officially began. So before the infusions began, pigs were fasted for about 12 to 14 hours. And the carotid catheter was used to infuse the various treatments into the piglets, while the jugular catheter was used to take those continuous blood samples, which I'll explain in the next few slides. So the four treatment groups were randomly assigned to the piglets, and they were saline, which was considered the control group, saline plus rapamycin, leucine only, and then leucine plus rapamycin. So for pigs and the rapamycin group, so the saline plus rapamycin, the leucine plus rapamycin, they were injected with the rapamycin solution one hour before the leucine infusion, while other pigs were injected with the diluent. And the leucine infusion began with a prime dose for 10 minutes, which was then followed by a constant leucine infusion. So to measure rates of protein synthesis, a modified 
flooding dose method was used. So 30 minutes before the end of the infusions, pigs were injected with 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of phenylalanine. So if they're, you know, weighing about two kilograms, they'd be getting about, you know, 20 milliliters. So not that much phenylalanine. So then whole blood samples were taken at 5, 15, and 30 minutes after this injection or flooding dose of phenylalanine. Um, finally, pigs are sacrificed at 60 minutes, and a sample of the longissimus dorsi muscle was collected and frozen in liquid nitrogen until analysis began. The protein synthesis was calculated with this equation that's listed on the slide here. So for the muscle tissue analysis, um, the muscle tissue samples were homogenized and centrifuged before being used. There were some amino blocks that were performed and primary antibodies that were used in them included PKB, AMPK alpha, TSC2, mTOR, S6K1, 4EBP1, and EEF2. Um, analysis of mTOR C1 and mTOR C2 was also performed using SDS page and immunoblotting with anti Raptor, anti Richter antibody, and anti GBL antibody. So, when they did statistical analysis, they used a one way analysis of variance, um, and the saline treated pigs were considered the independent variable. So if a significant overall effect was seen, then a Tukey Kramers comparison test was used to assess the differences amongst the individual means. So a p-value of less than 0.005 was considered statistically significant, which you know we typically see in most studies. So now let's go into the key results of this study. So as you can see in the figure from this study, um, I pulled this from the paper, Loosing significantly increased protein synthesis when compared to the saline solution. And these numbers, these superscripts kind of um, indicate significant differences. So again, that was, you know, leucine, as we can see from this graph, was much higher at producing protein synthesis when compared to saline. Um, however, rapamycin administration completely blocked leucine's stimulatory effect on protein synthesis within the skeletal muscle. So again, you can see the rapamycin groups kind of comparatively different compared to the leucine only. So when looking at upstream signaling components of mTOR, such as AMPK, PKB, and TSCT, TSCT2, it's a mouthful, there was no effects of either treatments on the phosphorylation of these components, so the leucine and the rapamycin component or treatment. And then as you can see on this figure right here, which um, this is from the immunoblot specifically, um, the rapamycin destabilized the raptor mTOR complex, um, which is involved in mTOR C1, which I showed in those previous slides discussing the research background. So there was a tendency, so the P was 0 0.2, um, for rapamycin-induced dissociation of this raptor mTOR complex to be greater in the leucine group when compared to the control group. So even though they um, did do, you know, P less than 0.05, it seems like they also, when they saw some interesting findings, they wanted to note that there were tendencies, even though this P value of 0.2 is a little above, you know, the statistical significance P value they were using. Then when we look at the mTOR phosphorylation at the two sites they use, the SAIR2448 and the SAIR2481, Leucine significantly enhanced the phosphorylation at these sites, but this effect was abolished by rapamycin. Then finally, to wrap up the results, um, kind of want to delve more into some of the complexes and such. So leucine was able to increase the formation of the active 
EIF4E, EIF4G complex. And as we've learned in class, this is important for initiation to occur. However, um, leucine inhibit, inhibited the formation of the inactive EIF4E, 4EBP1 complex, which is again important for initiation and has an influence on it. But rapamycin blocked both of these effects from occurring. So the rapamycin is, you know, inhibiting these from incur occurring, basically. And then finally, protein abundance of the signaling components was not affected by the short-term exposure of rapamycin that was done in this study. So maybe they just needed to have long-term, longer exposure time of rapamycin to see some effects of this protein abundance. And if you did want to look at this paper, they don't show the data on this last bullet point, but they did note it in the results. And I just found that interesting. So wanted to discuss them in this presentation. So now let's move on to discussing the key findings and kind of comparing them to some other studies, as well as the implications and kind of the general overall conclusion. So although there have been a number of studies done in this area, the molecular mechanisms in which amino acids regulate mRNA translation is still largely unknown. So that was a goal of this current study to understand better. So this uh, lab does quite a bit of studies and in a previous study done by this exact same lab, they demonstrated that leucine was effective at stimulating protein synthesis in the skeletal muscle of the neonate. However, it was to a lesser extent versus a complete amino acid mixture. So amino acids like leucine are important to regulating signaling through mTOR and they're controlling many initiation and elongation factors that are involved in protein synthesis. Um, however, rapamycin has been widely utilized to study mTOR functions because it is such a powerful inhibitor of mTOR. So in the current study, leucine infusions to raise the circulating leucine levels to such a fed state basically, um, because remember these pigs were fasted before the infusions occurred. Um, so when raising these leucine infusion levels to that fed level, it did stimulate protein synthesis, but when the rapamycin was added into the picture, it was completely blocked. So both rapamycin and nutrient deprivation can inhibit the activation of downstream mTOR effectors. But how rapamycin does this is still unknown at this point. However, there was a recent study done that showed that rapamycin interferes with the raptor's ability to present substrates like 4E BP1 to mTOR. So again, it's um, kind of messing with that complex. So in the current study, it did support this model from this, you know, previous or this recent study that found this out um, that rapamycin reduced the interaction of raptor with mTOR in both the leucine and the control group specifically. So now kind of let's wrap up and talk about the overall conclusion as well as you know, where this, um, you know, lab is interested in heading to next in terms of future studies. So the overall conclusion from the findings of this study is that protein synthesis stimulated by leucine and activation of those necessary signaling components for mRNA translation to occur within the skeletal muscles of neonates is sensitive to rapamycin. Um, however, in terms of the implications, so further research is needed to be done within this area in order to continue to learn about the significance of leucine's actions as a nutrient signal to stimulate protein synthesis in vivo, so specifically in the skeletal muscle. And I feel like this could be, you know, used again as this lab is interested in, you know, learning about nutritional strategies for neonates, um, this could be in 
effective at, you know, if we have neonatal children born, um, what to provide them to stimulate that muscle protein synthesis, because they are already, you know, smaller and more prone to, you know, maybe some issues down the line in terms of growth. So again, I think this study is really interesting because it's kind of combining, you know, the animal studies. We as animal science students are used to um, learning about, but how we can kind of pass that information along to, you know, better strategize on how to support, you know, these neonatal newborn children. Here are the references I utilized throughout this study. Um, I found some of them through Google Scholar, but also from, you know, the study itself, um, which is highlighted on, you know, this page as well. So thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Moodle discussion forum. And I look forward to um, learning a little bit more about the other studies that we were able to discuss in the seminar presentation assignment.